Well, good morning. It is 6.05 a.m. or sometime about that. You are listening and back on the air with the Thai Expat Daily Show as always. And thank you for tuning in. So before we get into it, don't forget to like, share, subscribe and, you know, all that good stuff that we love to see happen. So we've got quite a show for you today. We've got a number of different articles and some, you know, different things. How was your weekend, guys, out there? Good weekend. Did you get up to anything interesting? Love to know as always down in the comment section because I'm interested about you guys. Now, as always, the show has started, so we have to start off with the doom and gloom. So if you're living in Bangkok, guys, very sorry about the very, very exceptionally poor air quality that has been basically reported in 36 areas of Bangkok uh, all day yesterday, and it's going to continue for the rest of this week. Uh, Air quality in these 36 areas is below the safety standard, with the amount of PM 2.5 dust exceeding the 50 micron standard, according to the Air for Thai Facebook page of the Department of Pollution Control. The amount of PM 2.5 ranges from 34 to 68 microns. uh, And it's basically um, has been like that now for the last couple of days and it's going to continue that way. So people are being advised to wear your N95 mask, not to protect you from COVID, but to protect you from lung cancer or any other things you may, you know, if you, you suffer from asthma, this is not a good time to be in Bangkok and you may be affected. So obviously that's just a little bit of advice out there for people and hopefully, you know, you listen and uh, you don't get too bothered by it. But it is a regular event in uh, Bangkok and of course, Northern Thailand, especially with the uh, burning season that will probably get underway there in the next few days. Uh, also, uh, you know, people coming to Thailand, it's worth noting, you know, because I like always to inform you of what's going on and, ex- you know, to make sure you understand that, that there's a safety risk when you come here and rent motorbikes or cars. So here is the latest stats for people who are wondering about Thailand accidents and other things. And this is especially for tourists. During the last seven days, 262 people were killed on the roads in Thailand. Out of these, 11 were children, 8 were foreigners, and 6 were pedestrians. And 78% of deaths were motorcyclists. The most dangerous time was between 6 and 10 p.m. And that's now an average of 45 people have died per day this year so far from being on the roads here in Thailand. So that's a word of warning for people who, you know, are coming to Thailand for the first time. You're thinking, oh, I have a great idea. I'm going to rent a motorbike. Never been on a motorbike before in my entire life, but I'm going to rent one and I'm going to head off and it'll all be good. No, it's not going to be all be good. Thailand is not the place to start learning how to drive a motorbike. And that's just me giving you my personal common sense advice really just to remind you as well that an international driving license for a car does not qualify you to rent a motorbike here in thailand and we will be discussing this in another show about what should be done and what can be done to alleviate this very bad reputation that thailand is getting in relation to uh, road safety etc but for people who are coming to thailand please be careful when you're out here okay especially in tourist areas because it seems that all the foreigners on the roads, and are a lot of them, don't know how to road mo- ride motorbikes. And it's leading to more and more accidents. So please be careful. And remember, if you don't have a proper license, your health insurance more than likely is not going to cover you. That's just another thing as well. So you're going to have to pay out of pocket. So another story that's been doing the rounds in Thailand is in relation to the, uh, I don't know if you saw it, but there was a TikTok video of a Chinese woman who basically managed to rent herself uh, an escort, a police escort from uh, the airport to uh, Patia. I think it was Patia, anyway. And uh, basically she posted this on TikTok. Video was all there to be seen if you search for it. And uh, the reason she did was she couldn't believe what good value for money it was. She posted on TikTok that a friend of hers in China had told her that you could rent, you could, you know, you could, secure the services of police here in Thailand for a mere sum of only six or seven thousand baht and you'd be basically escorted through immigration you know fast tracked and then you would get a police escort all the way to your destination and yeah she couldn't believe what good value was so she decided to book this just to see if it actually was true and of course yes it was true and according to the Bangkok Post two traffic and one tourist police officers who appeared in this video clip posted online while delivering a VVIP service to a Chinese woman, have now been identified and are facing a probe. 
the service included an immigration clearance shortcut at the airport and a traffic dodging police escort all the way to her hotel in Pattaya. The woman posted the clip to a Chinese social media platform, aka TikTok. The national police chief labelled the incident a disgrace to the force. And that's according to what he said now on Sunday. The three officers have been transferred to the command centre of the Royal Thai Police pending an investigation. And they're all suddenly outraged. The interesting part about this is, you know, from a lot of people, if you read on social media, this is a common occurrence. This is nothing new. They just seem to have been really caught red-handed doing it. I know a number of people have told me they've seen regularly Chinese buses, you know, with tourists, with the police escort in front of them, heading from Bangkok to Pattaya. It happens many, many times. And I, I think we've seen this in the past anyway. But suddenly it's, it's, it's as if it's nobody knew what was happening. I think, number one, the fact it was so cheap is the problem. And the fact then of the, the money hasn't gone up the chain, you know, to make sure that, you know, all those hands are greased along the way. And I think this is probably the biggest uh, issue that may be going on in the police at the moment. But this has been going on a while. It's nothing new and nothing new at all. But it's just funny that they seem to have been caught now. Um, Thailand now are also, they're talking about Thailand are to use the five F's of soft power to promote tourism this year. Now you may be asking yourself, what the hell is soft power? So we're going to take a definition because sometimes I wonder if they really know what they're talking about when they mention things. So soft power in politics is the ability to co-opt rather than coerce. In other words, soft power involves shaping the preference of others through appeal and attraction. A defining feature of soft power is that it is non-coercive. The currency of soft power includes culture, political values, and foreign policies. Now, this has always been an issue, you know, with me when I listen to it, is whether or not Thailand actually know what it is before they, you know, start talking about it. But Thailand are going to use the five Fs of soft power to promote tourism this year. This is part of the big plan for tourism. Though they're doing pretty well in terms of tourism, it has never been busier. Uh, the country is doing very, very well, but obviously more is needed to be done. So Thailand plans to make full use of its soft power. Now this is according to Thai PBS World, which includes Thai boxing and food in the hope of attracting more tourists to visit Thailand this year. The acting government spokesman said on Monday that Prime Minister Priya chan cha has instructed all relevant agencies to promote the tourism sector through the use of the of Thailand's five Fs, which include Thai food, Thai films, Thai fashion, Thai boxing and Thai festivals. For Thai food, uh, the spokesman said that the government will declare 2023 the year of Thai gastronomy, during which the Bangkok International Food Festival will be held. The concept of walking streets will also be expanded. The amazing Muay Thai Festival will be held on February 6th in Prachip Kiri Khan to showcase the Thai martial art and the Wai Kru ritual for Thai boxers used when they pay respect to their th- teachers and trainers. Now, the government spokesman said that 3,500 boxers will participate in this event, uh, which it is hoped will be recorded in the Guinness Book of World Records. He also said that several festivals will be held in the middle of the year to highlight Thai national and local cultures, as well as local wisdom. Interesting. Uh, He said that the colourful lighting in Chinatown will continue after the Chinese New Year to celebrate the return of Chinese tourists in Thailand. This will be followed in mid-April by the Songkran Festival, which is expected to attract many tourists. And Songkran is everywhere. There's nothing new about that either. And on Thai Films, uh, the government spokesman said that the the film city tour package will be launched to promote tourism throughout the year. Now, I'll be very interested to see when this comes out, exactly uh, this film city tour package and what exactly it will be. I wonder, would I be just showing you the areas where certain movies have been filmed, you know? we'll see it's quite interesting but this is not really soft power and uh it's kind of he's the the prime minister has instructed the agencies to do this there doesn't seem to be much more instruction after that but thailand has a couple of good things going for it and yes thai food is one of them one of the most craved foods around the world if you ask people what kind of food you know do you like i would say thai food would always be in the top five you know, even if you're not into spicy food, there's other dishes you can have. And I do think Thai food is definitely up there. And Thai festivals are something to, 
you know, really enjoy when you go to them. And I think Thailand does good festivals, especially when it combines a bit of food, a bit of music and all those other kind of things. So, yes, but it's going to be hard to promote this as a whole because I, I, I think you have to focus on one or the other. But if you kind of try to focus on everything, it's just going to get muddled you know, up and your message won't be clear. But we'll see how it works for the Thai government in relation to this. I, I, I genuinely think Thailand has always done a good job in attracting tourists because I think it has a good project product in general in Thai tourism. But I think there's a lot of, you know, there is things that need to be improved along the way. And I think safety standards within the country for tourists in terms of, and for everybody else of course in terms of road safety just around tourist attractions and things like this i think making things better and more amenable to a tourist if they're going to go after these magic numbers of tourists every year they need to make things better because you know at the end of the day especially when you cut let's say the chinese for example right if if the chinese are sent, come here Right, and they're not being looked after well, and they're not being taken care of, and there's concerns over their safety, etc. The Chinese government can pull Thailand; they can just stop it, flick of a switch if they want, and say no more. And because of the way the country's set up, they can do this. There was talk a few years of it happening, and Thailand were very concerned. It was over tours and things like that. So these things can happen. And Thailand obviously noticed they need to be careful. And, you know, with the bringing in of this tourist fee in July, if it comes in, I would say, in essence, take this money to make things safer in Thailand. Uh, make the road safer, make, you know, driving. And, you know, when I say more tourists were killed on the road again, these things are all things that could, you know, be potentially fixed with a bit of time, money and effort. And I, I think a lot of people would agree with it. But I'd love to know your opinion about it, too. As a lot of people may or may not know, cannabis in Thailand has somewhat been legalized. Now, when I say somewhat been legalized, it's completely confusing to a lot of people because people ask me when they get here, can we smoke, go out and get a bit of, you know, marijuana, smoke it up, you know, sit down on the on the beach, have a smoke, blah, blah, blah. The answer is no, you can't, right? But the law is so confusing because there is no law and that's the basis of it. Now, according to an article that was in the Bangkok Post not so long ago, the Ministry of Public Health has issued guide titled 10 Things Tourists Need to Know About Cannabis in Thailand to Improve Visitors' Understanding of What They Can and Cannot Do with Cannabis in the Country. So, Thailand is the first Asian country to have decriminalized cannabis, which has led to great interest in cannabis-based products among visitors and people planning to travel to the country. One of the unintended consequences of decriminalization has been an explosion in recreational use of marijuana as cannabis was removed from the narcotics list in June last year before related laws were even considered. Lawmakers are still haggling over a bill to regulate the use and sale of cannabis as it is far from certain that it will pass before the House is dissolved to pave the way for an election this year. Now, just getting on that, they had a second vote last week and it failed in its attempt because... The opposition parties, who are actually being joined by some of the government parties, whether or not you know the government here in Thailand is made up of, I think it could be like 20-something different parties, have sided with the opposition saying that they agree with the decriminalization of marijuana, but they think it should be only used for medicinal purposes. And this is what the, basically the entire opposition say and believe, that it should be only for medical use. Not for recreational use. There should be no none of these dispensaries, these smoking bars open, etc., etc. And there is no chance of the bill that the government have put forward passing. Zero chance. Unless these opposition parties get what they want. Now, we have to remember there is going to be an election here in Thailand. I think May, April or May. Okay, assuming everything goes right and there's no shenanigans going on. And with that election will probably come a new government. So the Putai party, which are the kind of biggest opposition party, and they were the party of Taksin Shinawatra and his sister, who were all deposed by coups in this country. And they look like, again, they're going to probably, you know, sweep up in the next election, unless, as I said, there's some shenanigans. So if they get into government, you can be sure that this bill will be gone and it'll be replaced with only for medical purposes. So that's why the government are trying to get a pass now, but they've no chance and they've, they're basically complaining over it that, you know, why they can't get a pass, but because the laws and the way they've written it is just wrong. But anyway, 
that's basically the history of what's gone on. So the public health minister, of course, Mr. Anatan Sharabakul, has insisted the aim of the decriminalization is to promote medical use of marijuana and create economic, op- economic opportunities for local pe- people. Foreigners who want to visit Thailand just to get high should think again. Now, this is what he has said. But then he didn't pass any law to stop that. But in the current legal vacuum, hundreds of cannabis dispensaries, recreational and otherwise, have proliferated and they were well documented on websites such as High Thailand. Now I can tell you in Phuket, there's loads. If you even go up to Kaolak, I noticed there a few days ago, there's three or four in the centre of Kaolak now. It's a small little town, you know, so there you go. They pop up pretty quick because it's not illegal. You just have to have a license. And, you know, especially in areas, uh, other provinces that maybe aren't as much um, policed, you can get away with a lot more. So the ministry wants to ensure that visitors are clear on what the law permits so they can act accordingly. Now, what I think is funny when I tell you some of this is the wording of it. It has asked provincial tourism officers to distribute the English language handbook to visitors and it plans to make it available in other languages like Chinese, Korean, Japanese and Russian. So I'll actually leave a link underneath in the description, okay, for the uh, guide and you can download it. So I'll leave that there. So the 10 things tourists need to know are as follows. Carrying seeds or part of cannabis plants from and to Thailand for personal purposes is not permitted. Cannabis cultivation is legal, but registering on the Food and Drug Administration's Pluk Ganja application or through a government website is required. But just to let you know, bad news, pretty sure foreigners can't do it. Using cannabis flower buds for research, export and sale and processing them for commercial purposes requires an official permit. And again, would have to be a Thai company with shareholders, um, you know, maximum shareholders to be Thai. So again, foreigners can't really do that. Just, you know. Individuals under 20 years old, pregnant women and breastfeeding women are not eligible to use cannabis except under the supervision of health professionals. Possession of extracts containing more than 0.2% THC and synthetic THC requires permission. Dishes containing cannabis are available in authorized restaurants, but again, the THC cannot be above 0.2%. So it's really debatable what kind of alternative, you know, if people want to get high, that's not going to happen. Approved cannabis health products are accessible through specific channels. Vague. Smoking cannabis in public spaces, including schools and shopping malls, is illegal. It is illegal, but it isn't because the law doesn't actually say that. What it says is it's the smell that can be considered illegal and the nuisance of the smell. Put that there and smoke it. Avoid driving after consuming food or health products containing cannabis. A little bit of common sense. Now avoid, but it doesn't say it's illegal. It says just avoid doing it. You know, if it was illegal, it would say do not drive after consuming food or products that contain cannabis. And those who have serious, undesirable health outcomes from consuming cannabis should promptly see doctors for treatment. Again, a little bit of common sense. So with all this rules that came out from the government, none of these are really rules because there's no law to back it up. But that is the current and what they say. So example, if you're in a hotel and you want to pull out your bit of weed and smoke it, you're more than likely going to get a tap on the shoulder from probably hotel staff telling you, you can't do that. Sorry. It's the nuisance of the smell. That's the problem. So again, it, it's what you would expect when they brought it through. You know, they decriminalized it. They had no regulations in relation to it. And it's all up in the air. And it probably won't be fixed, as I said, until the next general election. And we get a new uh, government in power here. But yeah, that's how it is. And, you know, I think if you've... When I started this show um, back in May, when was it, 2020? You know, we're going through all this whole COVID thing. You start to realize when you're covering the news every single day and reading news articles, just how things change on a day-to-day basis in this country. And it's not just about COVID, but it's about everything and how poorly thought out things can be at times, you know? It's disappointing, I think, for people, especially people who've opened up these cannabis dispensaries and they're, they're investing their money. Now is the only time they're going to have to make money because in a few months, if it gets shut down, you're done. Because a lot of these places are kind of appealing to tourists. If you go to Phuket and you're in Patong or whatever, it's appealing to tourists only. They're not appealing to locals, they're appealing to tourists. So yeah, these places, you know, they're investing their money now, but what's the future? Probably not great. But again, they're going to lose money. But this is also the government's fault for not making things clear at the very beginning. And we're left kind of with this um, kind of bit of a vacuum at the moment. Anyway. 
that's how it is. So our last story is in relation to tiny Chinese tour groups and they're likely on the way. Now, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing for people, but there are positive signs for the tourism sector as Prime Minister Prai Chana Jha suggested China will soon allow tour groups to visit Thailand, which could lead to more hotels reopening and higher demand for bus tours. General Prai had said, that, uh, said Thursday at a Chinese New Year event in Ratchaburi that Beijing indicated Thailand will be among the first destinations to approve for outbound tour groups, while the Tourism Authority of Thailand confirmed on Friday that Chinese groups are allowed to visit Thailand and 19 others from February 6th. So this is somewhat good news, but Thailand are forgetting a lot of things about how these Chinese groups operate, and especially these tour groups. So many of these tour groups only use hotels that may be uh, Chinese affiliated. They only use buses and bus companies that may be Chinese affiliated. They use boats that may be Chinese affiliated. I think you get my drift here. So in other words, a lot of the money that's paid for these trips is paid in China and never leaves China. I think they call it zero bat tours. So basically the money never really gets back to Thailand. It always stays in the Chinese sphere and it really never affects and gets into the into the Thai economy. And this has been going on for many, many years. I don't remember, I don't know if you remember, before COVID, there was a very serious boat accident in Phuket where a lot of Chinese citizens drowned in a boat, a tour boat. And it turned out that that, chi- that boat was Chinese owned, certainly under a company that had uh, connections to Chinese businessmen. And at the time, this is all part of the thing. They only use businesses that are in some way connected with China. So the money really never gets to Thailand. And I think this is part of the problem with this. Thailand had vowed to stop these zero bat tours, but I don't think, I think as always, it was a bit of talk because I, I really do think that The government here are not too strong at standing up to China when they have to. And I think we can see with, you know, the rules that came in about COVID, um, you know, at the beginning of January, you know, we're not going to discriminate. So everybody has to do it, but we're not discriminating against the Chinese when many other countries did. And there's been really no recourse on these countries that have done anything. But Thailand seemed like they were quite nervous and scared to take any kind of decision against China at the time. And I think it's it's unfortunate that there seems to be certainly that fear of repercussions if they, you know, bring in certain laws, rules and regulations, you know, in terms of things. I mean, we had that big story about the Chinese uh, gangsters here. I think if you look back through the news, we might cover it in another episode. But again, that's kind of gone very quiet. You know, these guys are at all fake passports from Thailand, fake IDs, businesses, donating to the the biggest, the, the government parties, you know, big money being spent. And yeah, just no talk of it. It's in the news a week and then that's the end. You'll never hear anything again. You'll never hear about this guy, the guys who are caught being, being put in jail. You'll never hear about it. That's the way it is here. But again, as always, another story. Thailand doing much better in tourism at the moment. You know, we spoke during COVID about the government needing to do better to get people back here. But it's in general. And they are competing with a lot of other countries. But Thailand seems to be a big destination for people. There is a lot of Russians around in Thailand at the moment. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, that's entirely up to you. I've seen a few Chinese people, not that many. so But they're starting to reappear. The good old Germans will always come to Thailand. They enjoy it. You know, the colder European countries will come now because obviously it's warm here and it's cold in their own country and then of course Christmas and Easter will be busy with families from Europe when they have time for Christmas and Easter and all that but it is better but you know again we are still looking at staff shortages in a lot of hotels and things are just different at the moment but I feel things will get better soon but you know I'm always on the side of the Thai people and their ability and their need to make an earning and make a living and you know showcase their wonderful country what the government do is a different thing and that's uh, I think sometimes the opposite of what Thai people may be wanting, you know. But as long as Thai people are making money from all this, I think, you know, it's it's a very good thing for their country. They've been through, you know, very, very tough times in the last two to three years. And yeah, things are good. But that's it for today, guys. As always, thank you for tuning in. You got any comments down in the comments section? We would love to 
hear what you guys have to say. Again, if you liked the video, don't forget to like it. Subscribe to the channel if you already haven't. And that's it for today. And we'll see you again during the week.